Genesis 10. Genesis 10. Genesis 10. Genesis 10. Yep, at the very start. We've been trying to cover a chapter per session to keep us moving along. Yeah. Uh, which I like. I like to keep moving forward. But here we go. Um, really, what we have here is we have, um, you know, the the descending order, the family tree of Noah. We've, we've gone through um, all the chapters of, that have led us here is all the way to the flood, basically. And they've just come off the boat um, and are, are starting to, to populate the earth again. And so, um, you know, this is, this is an interesting chapter in that there's really not a whole lot of, uh, let's call it meat. There's not a whole lot of meat there. So, I'm going to read through the chapter, and then uh, we'll talk about that. So stick with me. I know um, it's, it's not going to be an easy one, but it's going to be good. I promise you. So Genesis 10.1, it says, These are the, the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Those are his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riffa, Tagarma, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kitten, Dadanim, Dadananim. <laughs> From these the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, and Canaan. Now these are the, the sons of Ham are uh, the cursed ones, okay? Because Ham went into the tent, saw his father's nakedness, and then apparently did something that was very disrespectful um, in ter telling his bro brothers. And so his father, Noah, placed a curse on him that his descendants would be the servant of servants, okay? So that's what we're seeing here. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabteca, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So you see how things have changed. We don't refer to Nimrods in that way anymore. <laughs> Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar, from the land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. Egypt father Ludim, Anamimim, Lahabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, from, from who the Philistines came, and Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sunites, the Arvidites, the Zemurites, and the Hamathites. Canaanites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hol, Gether, and Mash. Arpachshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Pegleg. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just what I think about every time I say his name. Like, um, Peleg. What's that? Socrates. Yeah. Socrates. Yeah. Peg leg, for in his day, his leg was divided. I'm sorry. His earth, the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almodad, <coughs> Shelef, Hazarmaveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzel, Dikla, Abla, or Abal, Boy. Obal. No wonder they were all screwed up. I know. Ab <laughs> Abmael, <laughs> Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of 
Sephar, to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Mm. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations, and from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Wow. Wow. You know, I think the most troubling part about this is we are all related to them. <laughs> so, yeah, the big leg and everybody else. So, and we're going to get to heaven and they're going to go, dude. Yeah. That is not nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> Come here, yeah. <laughs> That is an American's version of Middle Eastern names right there. But, you know, I go through, and, and uh, you know what I love about God? The reason I love these chapters is because God knows us all like this. He knows us all individually. And that's something that's special about our God that you don't see anywhere else. You don't see any other gods of today's world that know their constituents so individually, that know us, that know each of us like this, and, and actively seek us out, actively seeks us out. I don't know what tense I'm in, but actively seeks us out like this. But he's personal. He's a personal God. He personally takes care of each one of us. And it's easy to look at a chapter like this and, um, you know, God bless my wife because when um, she knows that we're going through a chapter like this, we'll take time together and read through these and read them again and again and again. And this was a tough one because you're reading that like every night. And the first thing she said when we read the, the first time through was, wow, this is so boring. Can you do the next one? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. But, you know, God has just so blessed me with this that, you know, you, you read through a chapter like this and you're like, man, this is so boring. Like, why is this even in your God? Why would God put a chapter like this in the Bible? Like, can't he just take it out? Like, I think I'm reading the wrong version or something. Like, it shouldn't be in here, you know? But you see, like, this chapter, a chapter like this, shows us all that God cares about us. Because I guarantee you that, I mean, obviously these are all dead people. And to us, they're just a bunch of names. But if you look at this, like this is somebody's dad. This is somebody's grandfather, somebody's great, great grandfather. And if it was my great, great grandfather, I would love to see his name in here. If it was my name, I would want it to be in here too. You know, and God knows us that personally, that he says, you know, I know these are just a bunch of old dead guys, but I'm going to put it in there because I knew them and I knew them personally. Wow. And this genealogy is the genealogy of Jesus too. Like that's where he comes from. Yeah. It's his story. So this is meaningful to God, just like our lives are meaningful to God. He, is, he isn't going to leave you out. I mean, I guarantee you that not even all of these guys that we just read even followed him in their lives. I guarantee you there's people in here that shun God and said, you know what, forget God, I'm going to do what I want. But they still made the Bible. Wow. What does that tell you about God? Like, how incredible is God that he would do that? That he knows us all like that. And he says, it's, it's not about you. It's, this is my story. This is what I'm doing here. And I want you to be a part of it, too. Like, man, that, that gets me every time. Like, how, how incredible is God that he would do that for us and do that for these old dead guys, too, you know? You know, I, our relationship with God is just so, so pure and so intimate and so individual in every way. Like, he, he loves us with an everlasting love. I love that that you can never find in this world no matter how hard you try. I think, I think so many people are out there looking for the love of God in another person, and then they're upset when they can't find it. And so they say, oh, you must not be my true love. Let me go find somebody else, and then I'll, I'll have my true love. And then they realize that that person's not their true love anymore, so they go try someone else. 
when really the whole time they've been looking for God. God's our true love. Amen. God is the only one that can fill our hole, that hole in our heart. That's right. We can't find that in another person. They don't have a love like God has love. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter how good you think you are at loving even your spouse, even the closest people to you. Neither of you have the love of God. And, and let, me, let me show you this in an illustration. Because when we're in a relationship, one person, our spouse meets our need, and then we in turn meet their need, and that's the way our type of love works. Because we say, okay, if you're willing to meet my needs, and I'm willing to meet your needs, then we can love each other, and we can make this thing work. But what happens when one person stops loving? The other person gets super resentful and says, you know what? You're not loving me. You're not meeting my needs. And so I'm not going to meet your needs. It's going to be done. And then it ends in a separation. What I'm showing you is this is not the love of God. The love of God is so much different than that. The love of God says, even if you don't love me, I still love you. Even if you totally push me away, I still love you. You're my creation. You're everything I ever wanted. That's you. I made you. I formed you. I breathed into you the breath of life. I made you who you are. And I love you. And I don't care if you're old and dead. I still love you. And you know, I've heard people say that uh, God doesn't love the wicked. He doesn't love people that push him away. And I want to show you a verse. It's in Matthew 5. Verse 43. Wait for you to turn there. But this is the perfect verse for this illustration in God and the way that he loves us. In verse 43, it says, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's the, that's the pivotal point. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. No one should ever be able to tell you because of this verse here that God hates anyone. That God doesn't have love for anyone because God loves us all. Right here. It also says that he's angry with the wicked every day. And absolutely, I'm angry when my kid doesn't do what I ask her to do too. But still love her. It's a different spectrum. I think we all see that in parenthood. How it's a, it's a different level. Like and love are two different things. And sometimes we throw love around like it's like. But it's two separate things. We shouldn't dull the word love down like we do. But it's the only word we have. And so we say it all the time. But love is something so much more powerful. It's like the difference between happiness and joy. Like happiness comes and goes. But joy, if you have joy, like that is everlasting. Love is the same way. You make your likes come and go, but love is everlasting, especially when it's from God. Like that's his kind of love. His kind of love is that he would love us all. He may not be happy with us all, but he would love us all. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, you just see that it's in God's nature. Like, he just can't deny himself. It's, it's part of who he is. It's part of his makeup, is love. Like, he gave that. I mean, I, I think he gave it more to, to women than he did to men. But, you know, that's part of who he is. Women have attributes of God just like men do. Like, they're, they are his creation as well. He just gave us, he gifted us differently. Okay? So just because women have different things than men doesn't mean that 
you know, God shortchanged women. No, he gave them attributes too, his own attributes. Um, and I think love is a, is a great way to illustrate that because we see that. It's, a, it's something different between men and women. But God doesn't allow us to change who he is. He doesn't allow us to change his nature. It is who he is. Whether you are who you're supposed to be or not, he is love. It's part of his nature. And so why do we allow other people in our lives to change our nature? Is it in our nature to love? Is it in our nature to draw close and to serve another person? Of course it is. But when they stop serving us, then we say, okay, it's no longer in my nature to serve you if you're not going to serve me. God doesn't like that. God says, even if you're not serving me, I will still serve you. And it says it right here. He makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. God is serving even evil people. Is that incredible? I know it's probably the most difficult thing that we'll ever have to entertain in our life is having to love someone who doesn't love us back. But you know what's beautiful about that? Is now we know how God feels. Especially in our children. Like we've created someone and we can be distant from them and feel like our children don't love us and we get a, an incredible sense of the way God feels about his people. And that's a, a sobering thought, I think. Man, I don't know why. I'm like emotional tonight. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> um, but man, I just... I don't know. I was reading a, a boring chapter and thinking, man, God, I, I know that this is here for a reason. Yeah. You know? I know that you you don't do anything just nimbly bimbly. Like you don't just throw things in there just because you had it. No, you have a purpose. And even this, even in the most boring of things that nine out of ten people are just gonna skip through and not even read into that chapter at all and think about why it's there. But you put it there. So why is that? And I'm just been like so awestruck in this chapter by the love of God and, and what he does for each one of us. Like it's just been incredible for me um, to see how God makes something out of nothing. So um, later on in Matthew 5, if you go down to verse 46, the very next verse, it says. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Man, and that hits me so hard. <laughs> because we see that in each of our relationships. God, in everything we do, is asking us to serve him. So it's not a direct, in our relationships, it's not direct service to the person that we're serving. We're serving God by serving them. We're serving God by taking a lower seat, no matter their reaction, no matter if they accept it or if they flip that place, plate up into our face, like I almost did to Amanda when we were eating earlier. <laughs> no matter what, God doesn't care about the result. He cares about the heart. Why did you do it? Why did you do that? Remember the... the um, widow that came through the line. Jesus is standing there after his triumphal entry. He's looking at the line of people putting their tithes and offerings in and he sees a widow put in two small copper coins and he says, there. That's the one I've been looking for. That's her. She wasn't the person that gave the most. She was the person that gave it all. That's what God wants. He wants us to him because he's worthy of that like he's given us all incredible gifts and incredible ways to serve him no matter who we are no matter what gift that is how we prepared ourselves how he's prepared us how much money we have all those things don't matter to God God owns it all anyway yeah. says he owns the cow on a thousand hills 
If he wanted you to have more money, you'd have more money. Like, he wants you to serve him where you're at right now. And so he says, remember in the parable of the talents, he says, those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much. Can't expect God just to throw a bunch at you when you haven't been faithful with the little that he's given you already. Be faithful with little and he'll give you much. It may not be monetary. It may not be in stuff. But man, he will fill you up to overflowing. And he'll just allow you to give more and more and more of yourself. And, and however that looks. However that looks for you, it's different for each one of us. But he, he uses it all. That's incredible about God. Um, you know, I, I wrote this down, and I know we, I kind of talked past, past this, but, you know, in, in reading this verse, and I guess I touched on this a little bit, I just wrote down that God takes care of us all. You don't see the wicked out there <laughs> starving and the righteous full. There's even wicked people out there that are full right now, even fuller than some righteous people. You know, that's not an accident. God doesn't just do that. No, we ask questions like, oh, why do evil people get a bunch of stuff and righteous people don't? It ain't about stuff. God doesn't care about the stuff. He cares about you. So whatever it is for his plan and purpose, he's going to do. And that's what he wants to do. So trust God with where you're at. Trust God with what he wants to do in your life. Now, let's go to Matthew 6. Go to a little less boring chapter here. We're going to be in verse 25. And man, I think this, this just sums it all up for me. And what we're talking about in God taking care of us all in 25, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Didn't we just talk about that? He doesn't care about the stuff. Life is more than that. And the body more than clothing. Look at the, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the, the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. <clears throat> but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the fire... Will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What does the whole book say to you? I'm so sorry. You can listen to Oh, you're listening to it right now. We're coming at you live. But seek first, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Yes. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Yeah. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Yeah. So good. Now, I know it's easy to read through a section like this and just say, wow, that's awesome, God, cool. Uh, next chapter. But realize that God is making us a promise here. God is saying that I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that you have food and that you're clothed. But realize this. God wants the glory. He wants you to know that he's the one taking care of you. So he wants to know that you know that he's taking care of you. So I've, I've, I've heard this from so many people like, oh, I've, I've, I don't know why, like I'm not following God right now, um, but you know, he's just not taking care of me like he said he would. And I'm like, well, what, what happens when you follow God? Like, what does that look like in your life? And we've talked about this before. If, if, when, when, you're, when God gives you 
blessing in whatever way, whether that's a material blessing or food or clothes or whatever it is, is he getting the glory for that? Or are you quick to grab that blessing and say, oh, I did this for myself. It's because of my skills and my good looks that this happened for me. And now I don't need God anymore because everything's going great. And then God says, nope, I don't think so. Why is that? And why is it so hard to see in our own life and so easy to pick out in somebody else's life? God wants the glory. God is your provider. And I know I was having, just in my own personal life, man, the blessing is like God just withheld any type of anything from, really, from, from our life for a long time. Because it just wasn't, it wasn't, there wasn't that connection. Like, God, this is you doing this. This is not me. This is you doing this. So if you're my provider, I should give that glory to you. If I'm allowing you to provide for me and you provide for me, then that glory goes to you. If I'm allowing you to provide for me and then you provide for me and then I take that glory, then you're not my provider, I'm my provider. And so God says, no, like you're missing the point here in your life, okay? If I give you a little bit, that's still a blessing. If I'm taking care of all of your material needs that keep you alive, that's blessing. It may not be somebody else's blessing. You may not like your blessing, but he still took care of you, didn't he? So are we giving God the glory for that? Are we letting him be our provider in that way? Because we have to allow, simply put, we have to allow God to be God. Because if we're trying to be God in our life, he knows that. And he says, no, you're not allowing me to be God. You're trying to be your own God. You're trying to create a God in your own image and serve that God, whatever it is. We all have it. But he's asked us to look for him, for our, uh, look to him for our provision and allow him to be the Lord of our life. I think what God says is saying to us the most through these verses that we've gone through is it's time to let go. It's time to allow him to be him and us to be us because we hold on to these things so tight and we just want them so bad. And we're like, man, maybe if I just work a little bit harder, maybe if I just do a little bit more, maybe if I just go to the next step, then I'll get these things that I want. And I'll be able to grasp onto them and I'll be able to, to, to have what I want in life and, and, and move to the next step and talk about that, that next car or that next house or retirement or whatever that might be. But God is just saying, hey, just let it go. Like, let it go and let me be God. Why, why are you making your own plan? I love when he, um, I know Jesus said this. I have no idea where it is. But he said, um, he's talking about some people that were talking about going from place to place and trading and selling and making a living and going to do these things. And he says, you fools. Why are you talking about what you're going to do? Don't you know that even this very night, your life, will be required, required of, you. of you. Thank you. Your very life will be required of you. He says, this is not your plan. This is my plan. If you look to me, I might give you some insight into my plan, and I might lead you into my plan, but it's still not your plan. It's my plan for you. I'm your provider. I'm your protector. I'm the one who takes care of all this stuff. I mean, we're talking about a God that takes care of the whole world and still cares about you individually. Like, he's got this under control. He's got this taken care of. I mean, look at just the amount of people on the world. Look at how this world works. Look at how it's just like, it almost looks automated sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, it just does what it does, and if you leave it alone long enough, it'll just do it. 
But you have to realize, like, God is the sustainer of all life. He says that. He's the sustainer of all life. It's his picture. So when we look and we see things that just look automated, you got to realize, like, God is doing that in your life. God is allowing nature to do what it does. And if we just allow God to do what he does in our life, it'll look automated to us too. Like, oh, God, like, I mean, this cracks me up because, man, I know people that, I don't know if they're just stupid or if they have great faith. Like, sometimes that line gets blurred. You know what I'm saying? You know those people? Like, man, uh, you either have the greatest faith or you're just an idiot. Like, I I don't know what you're doing. It's so true, though. You're like, I can't believe you did that. And I can't believe you're doing nothing about it now. For example. <laughs> I, can't, I can't point the finger at people here. I mean, no, you I'm, don't I'm have on. to point it at any of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, not naming names. But you see those people, right? And, man, when I look at those people, I'm like, how do they do it? But, you know, God just seems to work things out for those type of people, yep. doesn't he? And I'm like, man, God, if I tried to do that, it would have been a disaster. Right. But for them, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe God just knows that they are stupid. And, and <laughs> hey, I just need to take care of these people more. I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not God. I don't, I don't know how he does all these things. But you notice, like, he knows who we all are. Like, he knows us all individually. He knows how stupid we all are, even if we think we're smart. And so he knows in what ways he needs to take care of us. Because if we're not skilled in a way, he's like, man, I didn't gift this person in that way, so I think I'll just take care of them there and let them do what they do. Let them do the faith thing. I think he knows our intentions, though, too. You know, oh, for like sure. If our intentions are good, then he's going to help us out mm-hmm. a little bit. <laughs> even, if we're, even if it's a dumb idea. Well, so. one can only hope. I, mean. <laughs> one can only I know. Hope. He must do that for me sometimes because I'm not the smartest. Well, he does it for all of us. Well, sheep are not the brightest creatures. Right. They don't know. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who, who? Yeah. Sheep. 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 We're sheep. Oh, sheep. Yeah. Sheep. Yeah. We're sheep. Yeah. Yeah. We're dumb, we bite, and we stink. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. I bet you sheep think that they're very smart. Because if you notice, there's dumb people in the world that think they're very smart. But he knows that about all of us. Like, we all in our own mind, think that we're super smart. I'll get to you in just a second. Think we're super smart, but yet we're just, I mean, three pounds doesn't hold a lot. You know, that's your, that's your brain. Three pounds doesn't hold a lot of information. Except for our brain. That's versus what I was about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm so I remember that. Yes, hers is five. <laughs> so hers, hers is five? Yes. Yeah. How'd you find that out? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's from all the philosophy. Here's the thing. It doesn't hold a lot of information. So we all think that we're super smart. But God says, you know what? Man, I really need to take care of this one. Because people that think they're smart, he really needs to take care of them a little bit more. Because we'll just get ourselves into things and not know the way out. And it'll just have to be a God thing at that point. So God brings us all to whatever point it is to where he could get the glory. For some people, that's farther than others, mm-hmm. right? Those dumb people are like, oh man, yeah. I'm in way over my head right at the beginning. So God, would you take over here? And God says, okay, I'll do that. And pretty soon they're out of it. For people that are a little bit smarter, they get a little bit deeper trying to get themselves out of a hole. I got a bobcat. <laughs> oh man, I'm like <laughs> totally getting myself in here. I got uh, a bobcat. It's like a, a skid steer, <laughs> like a tractor basically with tracks on it. And I went down toward the creek and I hit a wet spot and I spun it around and I got like buried a little bit to where when I was pushing the thing forward, like it wasn't going anywhere. And so what did I do? I pushed forward harder to see if I could get it out. And then I took the bucket and put it down to try to wedge myself to pull myself out and then pushed it forward hard. And the whole time using my own wisdom, I'm just digging myself deeper and deeper and deeper, (laughs) right? So that's, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Like people who are smarter sometimes, I don't even know how we got off on this, but people are smarter sometimes dig themselves deeper holes before they say, hey God, will you get me out of this one? So don't feel bad if you're not very smart because if you just go to God faster, you'll get out of it faster. Okay, go ahead. 
I don't know if you guys have ever seen sheep in the natural light. Sheep. Like wild ones? Yes. Are there? Uh, well, I mean, sheep herders uh -huh. know they're a sheep. Right. And sheep, can, they'll be out, out just in the open. When that sheep herder comes and calls their name, just calls them, they come running. They're very intelligent. They know the voice of their master, mm -hmm. and so should we. For sure. Yeah, so that's they a, are smart. That's a great point. They're very smart. Yeah, I mean, we have turkeys around here, and you see them running around, and they just look so, like, Oh, they're just dumb. Dude, we're watching them out there. Dude, oh, we're walking around. They're super smart, though. Yeah, they are. I'll tell you, if you've ever been turkey hunting, you will they realize how smart a turkey is. Really? Yeah, yes. for real. They are one of the oh, smartest man. creatures. They're the hardest animal that. to hunt, I think. Seriously. They are super intuitive, and even if you're just sitting there, like, up against a tree, fully camoed, like, somehow they just, they're looking, and they're like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, they seem so dumb, but yet, like, God has given them what they need to survive. And he's done, he does that for us, and that's what he's saying here, like, God is going to give us what we need to survive. And he's just looking for us to, to relinquish control to him so that he could get the glory for that in our lives, so that we could say, you know what, God, I know you did that for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all that you do. So, us individually, to wrap this up, each of us individually determines how God works in our life. Okay? And I'm talking about in the way of blessing here. Because if God gives us blessing, and we're not faithful with that blessing, he's not going to allow us to have anything more than that. But if we're faithful with that little bit of blessing, whatever that looks like, then he's going to allow us a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more. And the more we're faithful with what he's given us, the more he's going to give us. Mm -hmm. That parable of the talents, he gives out five, three, and one. And the five and the three come back, and they were faithful with it, so he gives them more. He said, enter into the joy of your father, right? Right? Here's the blessing. I, I will make you uh, uh, rulers over much here. Butchered that. But I've, I've, whatever. You're faithful with little. I'll make you ruler over much. Mm -hmm. right. But that one comes back and he hasn't been faithful with it. And so he says, you couldn't even have, like put it in a bank and let somebody else do something with it. You hit it. You did nothing. And so let me take that from you and give it to someone who's going to be faithful with it. And so we see that in our lives. Like, if you're not faithful with what God, God has given you, he's like, I'll take that away and give it to someone who is faithful with it. So we should allow him to work in our lives and be faithful with what he's given us, no matter how little or how big that is. Be faithful with what he's given you, and he'll allow you to have more blessing. Not that we seek after the blessing, but we seek after the relationship that comes with that blessing to our God. The more he pours out, the more you know he's doing it. And so your faith grows. You're like, wow, God, you, you provided for me here, you provided for me here, you provided for me here, and now you're, you're provided for me even over there and something that I didn't even realize was going to happen. You already took care of it. So how incredible are you, God? How amazing that you did that. And we go around and tell all our friends like, hey, this is what God did for me. What has he done for you this week? What has he done for you? Because we bring glory to God. We bring glory to what he has done by sharing that with other people. So I'll just say, you know, allow God to have what he deserves. He is a great God. He is a mighty God. And he deserves that glory. He deserves even more than us, all of us can give him. So allow him that glory. Allow him to work in, the, in your life. And you will see just how great our God is by what he does with that. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much.
for just who you are, God. Man, it's, it's everything that you've done for us even to this point, man, it would, it would just, it's, it's already too much, God. You've already outdone yourself for each one of us. So we just look back and say, thank you. Thank you for your great faithfulness. Thank you for your great blessing. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. And I pray that you would teach us how to be faithful. I pray that you would teach us how to serve you and how to glorify you. Yes. I pray that you would teach us how to build up the body and not divide it, but make it grow. Plant that seed and make it grow, God. Ultimately, it's a salvation thing. This life, that's what it's about. It's about making a decision for salvation. So God, would you do that in each one of us? Would you see that the price that you've already paid for us was enough? If we got nothing else from you, if we had no more blessing, it would already be too much. So I pray that we would look to you, not the blessing, not the gift, but we would look for the relationship with you, God. Yes. Would you build our faith? Would you draw us closer to you? Would you help us to know you more? Would you give us new revelation in your word? Would you help us to see you more clearly, God? Right now we see dimly but one day we're going to see clear. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see you, God. Man, I, I think we all have like a picture of what you look like, Jesus. And man, when I pray, I just, I don't know what your face looks like. And man, I just want to know so bad. But I pray that you wouldn't let me because I just want to be so awestruck when I actually get to see you in person. I want to be so overwhelmed, God. I want to see you clearly. I want to behold all your glory. And I just want to be so thankful in that moment. So God, work in our hearts. <sighs> Work in us deeply, God. You know what we need. You're willing to take care of us. And all you want us to do is relinquish control so that you could do it for us. So that you could be our father and we could be your children. So that we could be your sheep and you could be our shepherd. To lead us by those still waters. To lead us to the valley of the shadow of death fear no evil but that surely goodness would follow us all the days of our lives that's you that's your blessing that's who you are so we look so forward to what you're going to do in each of our lives here God and we're willing to step in and let you work and let you be God thank you and praise you in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Amen.